chapter 24. Matthew 24. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. It's the first of four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This morning is now our second week in our 10th and final series in our journey through Matthew entitled The End Times. And this entire four-part series that spans chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew um, all happens on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside of the temple in the center of Jerusalem. And therefore, this entire conversation that happens on the Mount of Olives between Jesus and his disciples as he's answering their question as to his coming again at the end of the age, is referred to as the Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives. And let's remember the scene. Jesus and his disciples have now walked out of the temple. They've walked away from the Pharisees and the scribes, whom Jesus essentially told were going to miss out on eternal life with God because of this false religion they had created that depended upon human effort rather than trusting in the Messiah, the Son of God, who was standing in their presence. And one of the signs that the kingdom of God was going to be taken away from the Jewish nation and given to a Gentile people that was going to produce its fruit is that the temple, the center of their religious activity, was going to be left desolate and ultimately destroyed, with not one stone being left upon another. And what we saw last week is that in Jesus being aware of and in control over that event, the destruction of the temple, which then occurred in the year 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus made that bold proclamation, is that we would be wise to pay attention to and believe whatever else Jesus tells us is going to happen in the future, which in this particular conversation, he talked about his coming again at the end of the age. And while he does not reveal when that is going to happen exactly, What we saw last week is that his return is going to happen next. And the kingdom of God that currently exists in an already but not yet state on the earth will be a kingdom fully realized. Jesus is coming again. And today we're shifting from asking the question, when will that occur, to asking what will it be like when Jesus comes again to usher in the end of the age. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says. Wherever you're at this morning, the sanctuary, the lobby, the coffee house, or your homes, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Matthew 24, 36 through chapter 25, verse 13. Jesus is speaking here, and he says this. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding in a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would, ha- would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he is not aware of. He will cut him into pieces and assign to him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with the lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. 
Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is God's holy and inspired word for us today. Let's pray. Father, all scripture is breathed out by your Holy Spirit and is useful for teaching, for correcting, for rebuking, and for training in righteousness, so that we may be equipped for every good work you have for us. So equip us by your word today. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. How does the biblical teaching about the end times, the reality that Jesus is coming again as the Messiah, as the Christ, to usher in the end, the end of this world and the beginning of life everlasting in the new heavens and the new earth, as we read about last week in Revelation 21, how does that belief affect the way we live today? Well, for some of us, if we're honest, it has had zero effect on the way we live today. Yeah, that might happen someday in the future, probably after we die. And I know the Bible says something about it, but my life's motto is, life is short, live it up. For others, it's the pinnacle of our faith. It's the thing that gets us the most excited about being a Christian, even to the point of withdrawing from this life now and simply waiting for what is to come. Our life's motto may be, life is too long, get me to the end. The Christian world is all over the map as it comes to eschatology, this whole topic about the end of the world. For some, it's everything, and for others, it's nothing. And as I reflected on this reality this past week, it made me think it's similar to the different approaches people take to how they spend their money, spending it versus saving it. We can all think of people, maybe we are these people, for whom money burns a hole in our pocket. And and why would we think about tomorrow? Why would we save for tomorrow when we can buy or experience something today, right? We live in the moment and we'll worry about tomorrow if and when it comes. But we can also think of people, maybe we are these people, for whom spending a dollar requires a committee meeting, right? And every dollar is measured and directed usually into a savings account or a 401k because who cares about today if I might go hungry tomorrow? I had a friend who at the end of their life just could not break out of this method And could have spent their money on much better health care and services for themselves as they lived in an assisted living home. And they just, they couldn't do it. And they died with millions of dollars in the bank. Why is it so hard to strike a good and healthy balance as, as it comes to spending and saving our money? I think the same question could be asked of Christians in our approach to this future reality. Why is it so hard to strike a good and healthy balance as it comes to how we deal with the reality that Christ is coming again at the end of time and how we are to live today in that reality. This, I believe, is Jesus' goal in this portion of the Olivet Discourse, the end of chapter 24 and the first two parables of chapter 25. We only read the first one. I'll summarize the parable of the talents when we get to point number three this morning. But these three sections, the end of 24 and the first two sections of 25, combine to give us a picture of what it looks like to hold in tension the reality that Jesus will come again to usher in the end of the world and how it is that we are to live as we wait for that day. In a world and culture where people seek to live on the extremes, Jesus gives us a healthy perspective, a proper balance for living as Christians in the already but not yet of the kingdom of God. And so what we want to see in our text today is that because Jesus' return will be sudden and final, we must stay awake, watch, and be ready by investing our lives in God's kingdom and for his glory. We'll see this first in the sudden and unexpected nature of his return. Second, we'll see the finality of his return. And third, we'll hear the call for how we are to wait for that day 
by investing our very lives. And so first, let's see the sudden and unexpected nature of Jesus' return. This links us back to what we said last week, that nobody knows when Jesus is coming again. But we do know that the next thing to happen on the timeline of salvation history is that Jesus is coming back. And so it's near in that sense, that, it, that it's the next thing to occur. All those signs that Jesus told us about in the first 14 verses from last week's text have been happening since the first century onward. And therefore, the conditions are right for his coming again. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen next. Whether that's 200 years from now or two days from now, when Jesus returns, we cannot say we did not know he was coming. And when that day happens, it will be sudden And it will be unexpected. He says his coming will be like it was in the days of Noah. Verse 38. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, in that day, people had warning. Noah and his family preached the gospel. They called people to repent of their sin and to trust in God, just like today. But just like today, many, if not most people, laugh it off and go about their normal business. And it was in the course of that normal business, as they ate and drank and did the normal routines of life, that the rains began to fall. To say that Jesus' return will be sudden is to say it's going to be quick. It's going to be without warning, and will be unexpected. God will not broadcast to the world, you got one more week, you got two more days, five more minutes. But it will come, as Jesus says in verse 43, like a thief in the night. And no thief warns or announces that he's about to enter your house. So what are we called to do with that reality? What does it look like to strike a good and healthy balance as it comes to the suddenness and the unexpectedness of Jesus' return. Well, he tells us how we are to respond in verse 42. He says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And then verse 44, therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Think about that thief again, who may come in the night. No one knows if they'll ever be robbed unexpectedly by someone as they sleep. But many people prepare for that day, right? And they try to prevent it from happening, but if it does happen, they're ready. And so they purchase security systems, and they install cameras, and they lock their doors at night, and they keep their cell phone by their bed. Some even purchase a self-defense weapon. They're ready. They're alert so that if or when it happens, they are not caught off guard. And in using that example, Jesus is calling his disciples to be ready when that day happens. Be prepared now, before it occurs. You don't need to purchase a security system, but you need to know that your soul is secure. So that when Jesus returns, in the suddenness of that moment, your response is joy and delight because you were ready. Rather than terror because it caught you off guard. There's no five-minute warning. When he comes, we're either ready or we're not. And he is imploring you, verse 44, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Second this morning, let's see how Jesus' return will not only be sudden, but it's going to be final. And to get this point across, Jesus tells us the parable of the ten virgins, which in that day would have been the the bridal attendants, the the wedding party. They would have been young and not yet married women. And all ten of them go out to wait for the bridegroom, whom they knew was coming. But Jesus immediately tells us that there were five who were wise and there were five who were foolish. And what distinguished them from one another is their being prepared for his coming. They needed to be able to light their lamps when he showed up. And yet five of these women were foolish and took no oil for their lamps. They were missing an essential element for his coming, the oil in their lamps. A few weeks ago in chapter 22, we heard the parable of the wedding banquet. 
and how what was required to enter the wedding banquet was the wearing of the wedding clothes, right? You need to be clothed with and covered with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, apart from which no person will enter into eternal life with God. And here we see the same truth conveyed in a different parable. There was something required that we possess when the bridegroom showed up. And in this parable, it's the oil. And if you don't have it, there's a big problem. And five of these women did not possess the oil. They didn't have it. And so when they realize that the moment is upon them, that the bridegroom has returned, they have to try to rush off and buy it quick in the market. But it was too late. And they come back and they plead with Jesus, verse 11, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Five of the worst words I think you will ever hear. And in that moment it was too late because the moment of his return is final. And so the question for each one of us is do we have what is required, what is necessary? There are no second chances. There is no purgatory where you go and you sit and you wait and you hope to be cleansed. When Jesus returns, we either enter into eternal life with God because we have been clothed with the perfect righteousness of his son or we enter into eternal separation from God. And twice in this section, Jesus describes hell as being a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And therefore, the call for every person is to individually, personally respond to the gospel. It didn't matter that they were part of the wedding party. Every bridesmaid's, bridesmaid was judged on her own merit, on her own righteousness, and whether or not she had what was required. And so I want to sit in this awkward space for a little bit longer this morning. Because I think part of the reason why Jesus tells this parable in the way that he does is to wake up some of us within the church who are part of what we call the visible church, but not yet part of what's called the invisible church. And maybe you've never heard that distinction, so let me explain it for you this morning. The visible church, what we see with our eyes, is made up of people who are saved and at times, unfortunately, those who are unsaved. Who gather together Sunday after Sunday to worship who give of their time and their talents and their treasures, who try to live good lives and who do lots of religious things, some of whom are saved and some of whom are unsaved. The invisible church, which only God sees, are those whose names are written in the book of life. Those who have had their hearts regenerated and brought from death into life by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Those who are truly saved. And church leaders, elders, and pastors are called to do everything we can to make the visible church the same as the invisible church. It's why we do things like elder interviews and require professions of faith to be made when people join the church. And why we're starting to take shepherding seriously because we want people to be assured to the best of our ability of our standing before God. To testify that yes, we see genuine faith within our lives. And yet, throughout the scriptures, including this parable, we are told that there are those who, according to 2 Timothy 3.5, have the appearance of godliness. But their hearts and the things that they love can testify to a different reality. Think of Judas, who walked with Jesus for three years as a disciple, before ultimately betraying him unto death. Remember what Matthew, or Jesus said in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, at the end of days when I return, many are going to say this in verse 22. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And Jesus says his response is going to be this in verse 23. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And that same response is given in this parable. Lord, Lord, open to us. But his response was, I never knew you. And so I think Jesus is trying to prick the hearts of those who have been part of religious communities. Who think they're saved but have not yet crossed over that line of faith. Because this parable is all about ten people who on the outside, they look exactly the same. 
They, they dress the same. They do the same things. They're categorized the same. They're all part of the bridal party, and yet five were clearly different from the others. There were some who are wheat, and there are some who are tares. They grow up similar, looking alike, and at the end, some prove to be true, and some prove to be false. And so Jesus is warning us here in this moment, in the moment of his return, it will be final And there is going to be a separation that occurs between those who have the oil, who are wearing the wedding clothes, who have put their faith in and depend upon Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, and those who simply look the part, who depend upon things like being born into a Christian family, having been baptized at some point as a baby, church attendance, giving records, even their own morality. When he comes, his return will be final. And the call for each of us is to be ready to watch and to ensure that we are trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. Finally this morning, let's see Jesus explain how it is that we are to wait for his return. We started off this morning asking if there can indeed be a good and healthy balance As it comes to living life on this earth now, while also eagerly awaiting Christ's return. So that we neither withdraw from life completely, nor see this life as being ultimate. And we've already said that the reason we're called to watch and be ready is because when he returns, it'll be sudden and it'll be final. And yet, Jesus does not give us the call to simply climb up onto the roofs of our homes, stare up into the clouds, withdraw from life, and wait for him to come back. But to show us what we are to do, he tells us another parable, and it's the parable of the talents. And I would encourage you to go home and read it today, whether you're familiar with this parable or not, and to see it in this context, the context of his coming again at the end of the age. And I'll summarize parts of it for us this morning. At times, people assume it's talking about personal talents, like being good at playing instruments or having athletic ability. But as we saw weeks ago, talents in this day were a large amount of money, 20 years wages, right? So depending on income, anywhere between one and three million dollars was a talent. And so we're talking about money, and Jesus says the master gives three different servants three different amounts of money. To one he gives five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent. All generous and substantial gifts. And the first two servants take the talents that they've been given, and they invest it. And they end up producing double what had been entrusted to them. Meanwhile, the third servant, out of fear, fear of either having to give back to the master whatever he produced or losing what the master had entrusted to him, go and bury the talent in the sand and does nothing. And when the master returns, he says to the first two servants this in verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. That's funny. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Don't miss that Jesus just called five talents and two talents, right? Five times one to three million dollars. Little compared to what will be entrusted to us as we enter into eternal life with God, the joy of our master. There is so much more yet to come. Meanwhile, the one who buried what he was given was told this in verse 26. You wicked and slothful servant, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And in this parable, Jesus is showing us what it looks like to wait well how to live in these last days, which requires a complete shift in the way that we view our lives. It is to see all that we have as resources to be invested in God's kingdom, to see the resources of our life as that which God has entrusted to us. To some, we've been given five talents worth of resources. To others, two talents worth of resources and to another 
one talent worth of resource. And the question is not, do we all produce the same amount at the end of our life? The question is, have you taken what God has entrusted to you and invested it in God's purposes for the advancement of God's kingdom and for God's glory? See, to wait and to watch for Christ's return doesn't mean we sit around. It doesn't mean we just withdraw from this life now. No, it means we walk through life investing to see God's kingdom come as his will is done, more on earth as it is in heaven. It is to walk through life with open hands, recognizing that all the resources we have come from God, belong to God, and are to be used for God and his glory. Our life, our breath, our talents, our energies, our spiritual gifts, our money, our relationships, they are all on loan to us. And when the master returns, he's going to want to know, how did you invest what I entrusted to you in this time that you waited? Did you invest by trying to see my kingdom come more fully in your life, in your spheres of influence? Or did you simply waste your life by burying it in the sand? One of the books years ago that helped to set my life on a new trajectory that, that challenged me deeply to my core is a book called Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. And in it was this short section that, as I said, challenged me to my core. And I want to share it with you as we close out this morning and consider what it is that Christ calls us to do as we wait for him in these last days. Here's what he says. I will tell you what a tragedy is. I will show you how to waste your life. Consider a story from the February 1998 edition of the Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their yacht, play softball, and collect shells. At first when I read it, I thought it might be a joke, a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ on the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, see my shells? That is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Over against that, I put my protest. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life. I used to dream about retiring at 55 and <laughs> kicking my feet up for my retirement years. And that rocked me to my core. I have in my own life tremendous examples of people who are not wasting their life, but are using the resources God has entrusted to them for great kingdom work. People who go overseas and dig wells or make sure that Bibles are being translated into foreign languages, languages that don't have the scriptures. People who are delivering meals to seniors and, and tutoring children for their educational purposes. People who are writing letters to those in prison, both for encouragement and for gospel proclamation. Those who are serving actively in their local church and seeking to live on mission in their neighborhoods and on their streets. I'm so grateful for the many people that I get to watch not waste their life, but continue to invest and to wait well for Christ's return. Friends, Jesus is coming and his coming is near. We are called to wait, to watch, and to be ready because it will be sudden, it will be unexpected, and it will be final. And his call upon us is to invest, not waste the resources he has entrusted to us until that day. Those who do that will be able to stand before their maker, their creator, their savior, and get to hear the words, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we each need to have our lives shaped and affected by the reality of your return. Lord, I am so convicted of how easily that which you have entrusted to me can be things that I use only for myself and my comfort. 
So help us, Holy Spirit, to be kingdom investors who take what you have entrusted to us and to use it to see your kingdom come as your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that if there is any today who are unsure of whether or not they are ready for your return, that they would take that step today and make Jesus the Lord of their life. We pray this all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.